Our speaker this evening is Professor Elaine Traharn of Stanford University, and it's our pleasure to welcome her back. <clears throat> She's given us several fabulous talks over the years. I'm sure you remember the one a year ago on St. Nicholas, which she gave us December of 2020. Her talk this evening coincides with the recent publication by Oxford University Press of her latest book. <clears throat> the book and the title of the talk this evening are both Perceptions of Medieval Manuscripts. She will discuss how, how medieval books were understood and used in the pre-modern period and how contemporary users and abusers of manuscripts have treated these historic objects. And she also wants to reassure you tonight that there will be nothing computational in her talk. That was a thought I introduced erroneously in my announcement. So I apologize to Elaine and to all of you. She's fearful some of you won't come because of that reference. So I apologize and please welcome Elaine Train. Thank you, Evelyn. There's no need to apologize at all. My, um, I think, you know, my projects do overlap and I am doing digital and computational work on medieval manuscripts, but um, that's not the focus of my book. And so not the focus of tonight's talk and the book is here. It's a nice book. It's got, well, it's a nice cover, let's put it that way. Before I begin any of that, can I just say thank you so much to Evelyn and thank you so much for having me back again because I do pop up like a bad penny and um, I just it's so lovely to see Bill Mart the last time I saw Bill um, of course was at George Brown's memorial service in St Thomas Aquinas um, in fact just before Christmas when Bill and his singers um, performed a two hour well it was about an hour and a half long sung um, Latin Mass, which was just incredible and such an, um, an honour to be there. And also um, such a beautiful way to remember George Brown, who I'm sure many of you knew. Um, he had been at Stanford as a medievalist for 50 years. So I'd just like to pay tribute to George and to Bill. So um, yes, so there, so there was that. And we're hoping to do a small memorial sort of seminar on medieval manuscripts for George much later this year, perhaps in the spring quarter, perhaps in the um, very early autumn quarter. And um, all of you at the Serum Seminar would be invited to that. And I'll pass the information on just as soon as I have it. Um, in the meantime, I'm <laughs> really glad to be here to promote my book. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's very nice of you to indulge me. Some of you may have um, come to the seminar that I did for CMEMS, for the Centre for Medieval and Early Modern Studies, um, in December when I was actually in the UK. So I had to beam in on a cold November, uh, December evening from the UK back to Stanford to do this seminar. And um, it was also on, on my book, but I've done something slightly different for tonight with different kinds of examples and different, um, a sort of slightly different approach to the volume, which came out in October in the UK and I think um, is, is available internationally now. And um, it's just part of the overall Oxford literature list, literature and history list. So um, should be accessible. It might go into paperback uh, sometime later this year. And really what it's about is trying to understand how medieval producers and users of manuscripts both conceived and perceived the medieval book. And the subtitle of my monograph is the phenomenal book, um, both because um, it's about the, the books, the phenomenon of the book, the medieval manuscript, but it's also about the phenomenological um, understanding of the book. That is how the real book functions in the real world. So not hypothesizing about manuscript production, not kind of De uh, deconstructing books as so many manuscript historians do where they kind of you know peel back the layers of the book to get to some kind of original book or to think about the production of the book per se but actually to think about the whole object the thingness of the object as it moves through the world and in terms of its biography so thinking about the biography of these textual and imagistic products and that brings us right into the present day so the book covers the terrain of 
I think the earliest book I talk about is sixth century, from the sixth century to the 21st century, and to the way that the book is received, the manuscript book is perceived and received in the 21st century, uh, when often, as you will all know, it is the um, it falls victim to uh, cultural vandalism in book breaking, and is you know books are sold and chopped up into little bits on eBay, and I'll I'll show you some images and, and talk a little bit about that towards the end. Um, but also how we how we now mostly approach medieval manuscripts to a very large extent, unless you're in a, an extremely privileged position, through um, online digital repositories. And, and in what way, there's a chapter on that in the book, in what way do we understand, well, do we understand the medieval manuscript when we only ever encounter it in that virtual form? So um, that's a kind of very quick and sort of general introduction. And the reason that I work on this, um, is is a result of a project that I was the principal investigator of about 15 years ago, which was to catalogue English in the post-conquest period when most scholars said there wasn't any English in the post-conquest period. And in fact, there are about 120 big manuscripts containing English from the period 1070 to 1220. So we initiated this project. And in order to do a digital project like that, a digital catalogue, you have to tag you have to create metadata for all of the components of the books that you're describing and we realized that metadata makes you privilege particular kinds of information over other kinds of information and given that most, uh, quite a lot of the stuff that we were working with in the 12th century um, is in the form of annotations and marginalia showing the vibrancy of English but not through the main text through um, things that were going on in the edges our main focus was on the marginal, but when you think about trying to tag that or turn it into metadata or describe it in the context of the manuscript as a whole, there isn't a really, still isn't, and definitely wasn't 15 years ago, a particularly effective and meaningful way of doing that, other than through the simply linear metadata tagging. But when you do things linearly, you're necessarily being hierarchical, right? You're necessarily privileging something at the top of the linear description. And that in itself is a problem. So I started to think about the book as a whole object. And I started to think about it as a sort of three, as it is, as a three dimensional object and how we can better conceive of the whole book, the marginalia, the main text, the end papers, the boards, the covers, the images, the additional foliation that's done in the later Middle Ages, the annotations, the damage, the thumbprints, all of that. How can we conceive of that? And it took me quite a while to develop a sort of theory. I mean, I hope I apply it consistently. Um, I call it dynamic architectuality, but actually really it's about thinking about the book as a building, thinking about it as a whole construct, thinking about what I call uh, books as letters, um, edifices of letters. A book is an edifice of letters, right? It's a, it's a, it's a whole single unified thing. Um, anyway, so it took me a while to find a way to, to talk about this. And I don't know now that the book is out and it's terrifying, terrifying to think about people reading it and even more terrifying to think about them reviewing it. And I'm thinking, God, did I, I hope I applied that kind of really consistently. And then I'm thinking, did I, in fact, use a, sledge, use a sledgehammer to crack a marshmallow? Is it, was it, is it so obvious <laughs> that books are whole and everything counts? I actually don't think it is. I think the way that we go about critiquing books and, and approaching books and certainly discussing them as scholars tends to, you tend to dissect the book or just take out the bits you're interested in, like the texts, or if you're an art historian, just the images. Um, anyway, so there's lots of generalities. And uh, I'm going to, so is there, um, I'm going to, in the time on a tradition, share an overlong um, set of slides with you and I will sort of finish um, Evelyn or Julia, should I, um, it's 7.15, should I talk, should I aim for about, um, oh. Hello. What happened then? Oh, we're, we're viewing Joyce Johnson's screen. So I think you might want to turn that off. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, do you want me to, should I sort of finish around eight? What, how long should I talk? 45 minutes? Evelyn, talk as long as you want. We're all <laughs> eager to hear it all. You can certainly go way past eight if you want. 10 p.m. Perfect. No, actually, I've been. 10 p.m. Wonderful. 
<laughs> I've um I've been teaching for three hours today, so I, I know that doesn't sound very much, but it's a lot when it's just you droning on. So I'll 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 aim for about no definitely no longer than about um an hour. Um okay, so I'll share my screen. Uh, and we got it. Good. Let me just um hang on a sec, move. Because I'm now working on my small screen. This is okay, play from start. All right. So actually, um, just to kick us off, to start us off, this this particular image isn't even in the book. And this particular image, um, which is uh from Paris, uh Bibliothèque Nationale, Lat 943, with otherwise known as the Dunstan Pontifical or the Sherburn Pontifical. It's a British manuscript, it's an English manuscript with um, Breton origins that has ended up in the Bibliothèque Nationale and um, I was uh, just browsing manuscripts at the weekend as I tend very often to do and I came and I've seen this one before years and years ago never really paid that much attention to it but I started going through it really very carefully and looking at all the different materials and um, found this image on I think it's folio seven or eight verso um, this image, which I didn't talk about in my book, but could have formed a very nice kind of synoptic starting point for um, for the book. So let me just give it to you in, in, in full there, as you can see it. So the Sherborne Pontifical was created possibly for the use of Archbishop Dunstan. He became Archbishop of Canterbury in the second half of the 10th century, and he was one of the principal instigators of the Benedictine reform in England, a very pious man who, um, despite the fact that he was Archbishop of Canterbury, led more of a sort of monastic lifestyle. And um, so this book is a kind of important window onto, uh, onto his life. And what I'm really interested in in these images, and there are, I discussed dozens of them in the book, but I could have discussed thousands. I mean, there are thousands of images, aren't there, of um, books in uh, medieval manuscripts, so like this book that's being held here. And there are also thousands of images, and particularly of the four evangelists holding um, writing equipment and being shown at their desks, pursuing their scribal activities. So I, want, I wanted to do quite a thorough study of these depictions of scribes at their work, and it, and it, it just was an impossibility. I had two research assistants working for me. This is how long I've been working in this book. They were working for me in 2010 to 11. And by the time they had finished working for me at part-time through the course of um, the academic year, they were sending me, and even th at this point, 12 years ago, hundreds and hundreds of images that they had photocopied or extracted from manuscripts for me to look at. So, so I kind of boiled it down to some key examples in the book of depictions of medieval manuscripts and scribes to try and think about how these illustrators, artists and um, writers seemed to understand what constitutes a book in this time. And so this is quite a good example, actually. This is um, Christ. So we know that because of his, his crossed nimbus and he's holding this really flamboyant, exuberant um, red quills. Let me just go back. You can see it better in this slightly blurry, but nevertheless, you know, close up of the quill. This very long, red, feathery, flimsy, but flamboyant quill in his, um, in his right hand. And then in his left hand, he's holding his book, but he's holding it veiled. So his, um, his garment is actually draped over his hand and uh, the garment in effect protects the book from his hand or uh, you know there are a number of different ways to read this and this is the this is the kind of detail that I'm talking about in one of the chapters in the book which in my book which is about how medieval manuscripts are depicted in miniature in medieval manuscripts the most important thing to take away from this is that they are depicted whole. So medieval manuscripts, think about all of the images you've seen in, I would say, the vast majority of depictions of codices or book-like objects. In the vast majority, they are, they are depicted whole as if they were um, bound 
um, as if they were hefty, weighty objects. Now, you know, so, so what? Because, you know, that I don't think that's exactly, that's, that's not really when I pointed out, it's not a startling observation, but the way that we tend to, um, the way that we tend to regard uh, these objects is, um, what's the word, archaeologically, and we tend to work on medieval manuscripts. Sorry, I've just, let me just um, start my video. The way that we tend to regard these objects is stratigraphically. When you talk about a medieval manuscript, you talk about how many choirs there are, you talk about how many folios, you talk about this and that part of the manuscript as having been put together in the, in the Renaissance period, but didn't originally start out like that. You know, you will have seen this in everything you've read on um, texts and, uh, uh, and books from this period. There's this kind of inclination to want to, as I said at the very beginning, sort of deconstruct these books, but actually these books were always already thought of as whole. And that is really important for our understanding of the medieval conception of the book. And then it is really important to bear that in mind when we consider um, how books are displayed, digitized and treated by contemporary book breakers, who in all of those aspects, whether it's display in, in glass cases and exhibitions, or whether it's digital images of books which are cut into their individual folios, whether it's if you work, if you're on social media at all, you'll see snippets of manuscripts. I do this myself, but you'll see snippets of manuscripts um, sent out for public consumption. Um, and all the time um, neglecting to understand that the book functions as a whole. And to the point, I think, where book breaking is not illegal because a book is not thought of as a singular work of art, whereas in fact, um, you know, I would argue. Um, that's exactly what it that's exactly what it is and that is exactly how it should be regarded as, as a singular work of art in its moment of um, survival into the modern period. So I can write, kind of reinforce that and I do discuss this image in Perceptions of Medieval Manuscripts and this is a delightful, delightful image that I don't think has really ever been discussed um, in a work of scholarship before. Um, you can see, so this is Lambeth Palace 107, it's partly digitized, it's partly available online. It's, you know, there are some, some photos of it are um, digitized. The second half of the 12th century, um, it's thought to have been produced in Bildwas um, uh, Abbey, uh, which is on the borders of the border of Wales and, uh, and England in Shropshire. And it's um, Hugh Folio's stages of the monastic career that's depicted here. And then Hugh Folio texts and pastoral text in, in the manuscript itself. And I'm interested in the whole image here of the of the cycle of monastic life, but I'm obviously I'm particularly interested in the- Elaine? Um, yes, I- Your I, slide I, hasn't advanced. Um, what can you see? We're still at your first image. Ah. Really? So this particular, so obviously I'm interested in the chap at the bottom there, um, who is, as we're told by the um, Latin sort of tag, hic sedit in pauper, paupertate, sicut cum hilaritate. So he sits in poverty as if in cheerfulness, right? This um, monastic Cistercian scribe here on his super comfy cushion um, seat and the lectern or, um, a, a, that he's kind of twisted towards, right? If you look at the way that he's sitting. I mean, he's, he is starting to write uh, the opening words of Psalm 1, Beatus Vir, you can just see um, in, the, in the book um, that he's copying. And you, it's very difficult for you to tell, but he's got um, a very small red quill pen in his right hand, held between his index finger and his middle finger. And then he's holding his knife. He's kind of clutching his knife um on in his left hand uh, scraping out mistakes whatever he's doing as he goes along so can you see that are we still on the right slide yes we're okay, on that great. slide great Thank you. yeah so what is also very interesting about this is the way that the whole book is depicted as i say this is not a book that looks as if he's copying out a single um 
leaf or or whatever if you look really closely you can see the end band the tabbed end bands of the book here and the way that the book is sort of sitting it's as if it already has the structure of a fully completed book despite the fact that he's um, currently participating in in writing it himself of course it's a single column format in the same way as the book so one of the very interesting things about these images of books in books is that not only do they depict the book itself as a whole already conceived object um, in ways that are obviously not not in, not entirely realistic um, but when I say not entirely realistic I say that advisedly because some of the time these books in images, are self-referential, so they appear to be um, codicologically akin to the book in which the image appears itself, all right? So this book, Lambeth 107, is of a kind of comparable proportionality to the book that this Cistercian monk is actually copying. And I'd, <laughs> I've done quite a lot, I've done quite a lot of close investigations of books in miniature, um, using the hand as a measurement, so uh, it's a it's a you know it's a proportional thing. Using the hand as a kind of, in the image as a measure to think about the size of the actual manuscript in which the image appears itself. I hope that's clear because it's a little difficult to explain. But so this actually does form, as I say, part of my exploration of these books as wholes. And you know, I you know, as I say, I could have chosen thousands and thousands and thousands of examples to make the point, but I obviously didn't do that. I picked um, just a couple of dozen probably. Um, and this was another one. So in, in one sense, it doesn't matter um, if we're looking at illustrated depictions of manuscripts in manuscripts, or if we're looking at something like this, which is this Brandon plaque. Again, it's an English um, object from the beginning of the ninth century. So an early, uh, relatively early, um, depiction of a book. I mean, there are others, you know, in, in earlier manuscripts and so on, but um, and in, in the Ravenna mosaics and um, mosaics in Rome. But um, this one is uh, quite, can you see it still, the Brandon plaque? This one is um, quite interesting. It shows the, um, obviously the evangelist John carrying his book with a very sort of thick quill in his um, right hand. And again, you know, although it's difficult to see, the three-dimensionality, the heftiness, the volume of the book is provided in what looks to us like a frame. I think that is meant to represent the three-dimensionality of the heftiness of his gospel. Um, and then again, in terms of uh, kind of object referentiality, um, it's thought that this plaque um, was a book cover. And um, so that's a really kind of rather um, lovely... Uh, you know, depiction of the object, um, depiction of the object itself. Okay, so, you know, as I say, there are, okay, there we go, lots of different kinds of examples, and you should see in front of you now um, a close-up and the back image of the Encomium Emma um, Regina, which is um, London British Library additional, ah, oh, I can't quite remember, but something like 44237, something like that. The encomium Emma, Queen Emma, obviously um, King Athelred the Unready's wife, and then King Canute's wife, um, and mother to Athelred's two sons, and mother to um, uh, Canute's two sons, or was it one son of Athelred? Anyway, so she was the wife of both of these kings. And after the death of uh, Canute, she was trying to secure her own position at court in the 1040s and into the 1050s. And she had this encomium Emma, in praise of Emma, this Latin work. Um, she, she, was, she commissioned this work um, of self-praise. And um, it's thought that a monk of Saint-Bertin um, in the Low Countries uh, wrote it, wrote the encomium in Latin. And this is the uh, frontispiece to the work itself. Some of you may have seen it. It's a very well-used image, but I'm not sure that anybody has ever stopped to talk about the book. And this is another issue. Um, in the, this post-print, it's, not, it's not, not even post-print, is it? This digital, richly imagistic society that, that we live in, in a society where um, literacy, especially in the, you know, many parts of the um, developed world, literacy is so high, taken for granted, where books are just part of our everyday 
furniture where you can't even sell your paperback books. I mean, you have to give them away. Nobody wants to buy them anymore. So where the book is 10 a penny, what I think, you know, what we what we tend to do is to take that sensibility with us into things that we encounter from the past. And just, and you know, there's, a, there's an unspoken or unthought assumption about the, the proliferation of images like this, um, about the proliferation of kind of books in images, and as if we just understand that books were there and they were present. But of course, they were remarkable objects in this, in this period. And so to stop and pause whenever we see books in images, like in illustrations or images like this, I think is a, is a really important thing to do. And in the case of this book, which is being presented to Emma by the author, I draw your attention again to the veiled hand, to the cloak that covers his hand and protects the book from his hand or uh, acts as a kind of veil um, in that uh, very um, exegetical sense of veiling. Um, it acts as a veil as he presents her with what appears to be um, an open book. So it's open not to her, but it's open to us as the viewer. And um, her two sons, her two sons with Knut, Arthur Knut and Harold are peeking round the, cur the curtain here, kind of observing this, where they're Byzantine-esque, um, edifice, edificial, like, like edifices, they're Byzantine kinds of crowns on. Um, and what's really interesting about this book is not only what I'm talking about in terms of self-referentiality and the proportionality of the book, because if one does the measure to the hand, then the book that is being presented is approximately the same size as the book in which the encomium itself is written. But also in presenting this book to her with it facing outwards, what you have is something that looks like a scenic writing. Um, and if you've not encountered the term a scenic writing before, it's writing. It's the use of symbols that look like writing, but are not in fact legible or a meaningful writing system itself. So it's something that is meant to uh, simulate um, writing. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's particularly, just particularly interesting in terms of the way that the illustrator cho chose to do this. Um, so anyway, I talk about that, uh, that image in the book. And then, you know, it's interesting when there's a scenic writing on books, it's interesting when like the Brandon Plaque, um, the book that he is holding, the Eagle John is holding was blank. Um, it's interesting when you see a book like the one that the um, Lambeth 107 scribe was copying, where he's, op he's copying the opening of the Psalms. What is on these little books is often really revelatory, very, very interesting. And this snippet, um, this half folio that I'm showing you here now um, is from the St Albans Psalter that was written in the first half of the 12th century and um, probably commissioned by Abbot Geoffrey um, at St Albans, possibly for the Christ uh, Christina of Mark Yate, the anchoress who had escaped from Huntingdon and made her way um, south to um, Hertfordshire where she took um, refuge in uh, a hermitage near to St Albans and um, she got kind of adopted by the um, monks of St Albans and set herself that she was set up as the prioress of, um, of a nunnery uh, just up the road from St Albans and so this uh, actually some of you may have seen it it was on exhibition at the Getty probably gosh seven years ago something like that and interestingly when it was on exhibition at the Getty because they had disbound the book in order to digitize it and to study it and to rebind it, in the guest seat, it was exhibited in bits. So the exhibition cases had an opening um, or a choir um, or a closed choir, and so a single folio. And the only place where you could see anything resembling the book as a whole was in the digital uh, turn the pages iPad kind of um, display that they had at the sides of the glass cases uh, that showed this set this book in, in its disparate parts. It was very curious um, 
I didn't really, I didn't put, I didn't like it. But on the other hand, lots of people could see lots of the book. So um, there's something to be said for that. Instead of the normal way in which we perceive books in exhibitions, which is open to only one opening, where the book ceases to function as a book because you can't turn the pages, you can't do anything with it. And books insist on our kind of participation. They're very uh, interactive. Um, they demand you to move through them in order to function properly. When they're in an exhibition case, obviously they they cease to have that functionality. And yet in this uh, Getty Museum exhibition, the book's functionality was massively enhanced, or at least its visibility, its perceptibility was, you know, really significantly enhanced by it being disbound and unbook-like. Um, anyway, that's not what I talk. Well, it's not really the, the, the reason why I put this image here. This image is um, obviously David on the right um, of the L and um, Christ on the left with his crossed nimbus. So Christ is here looking down at David in this beautiful historiated L. And it's the opening of um, Levavi Oculus Meus in Monte. So I lift up mine eyes unto the hills. And on the book, there is a hefty, weighty, almost tablet like. Um, tome that David is holding open towards us. Um, the, op the opening words of the psalm reappear, Levavi Oculus Meus in Montes, which is sort of, you know, sort of curious and not how all of these books function in this manuscript. But in fact, he's pointing not to that the opening lines of that psalm, but to auxilium meum ar domino, so my help comes from the Lord. So he's pointing to my help comes from the Lord, which brings us into I lift up mine eyes unto the hills, which takes us up to his eyes, up to Jesus. And you get this kind of um, catena of, of emphasis of words and bookness, right? It's all connected um, by Christ's foot and the book. Um, in this, you know, this is very typical of um, the cleverness of the St. Albans Psalter um, illustrations, because every psalm opens with a, a very large decorated um, or historiated initial, and books feature in something like, I think it's something like a third of them, um, as these really kind of core components of Christian understanding. Uh, and that's you know, that's the kind of given, I think, for um, something like a Psalter. So one of the last ones that I'm going to discuss in this kind of uh, part of what I'm going to say in terms of illustrations in books is this manuscript, which is London British Library, Yates, Thompson 13. And um, again, I don't think that what I talk about in my book has ever really been noticed by art historians before, because it's mostly art historians who tend to work on these books of ours. And perhaps unremarkably, books of ours are not of tremendous interest to textual scholars um, in a way that really they should be. And partly, I think, because books of ours seem so formulaic, rather like Psalters, that you think, well, one is much like any of the other 10,000 surviving examples. Of course, that isn't the case at all. And they're very rich. Um, they're very rich for, for any kind of study and particularly to do with code ecology. And this particular example is just, um, it's the Tainmouth hours. So Yates Thompson 13 is the, the Tainmouth hours and it's um, second quarter of the 14th century of English um, origin. And this book, this little book of hours, I'm just gonna whiz through a couple of images, right? I'm going to talk about these images, but there are many, many other images in the book I could I could speak of. Speak of. There is a connection between a lot of these images and the bookness of this manuscript, of this book of hours, um, and especially in relation to its patron who um, uh, is depicted here, um, also holding a book, right? Um, together with these other people who are holding books, including this woman on the right, is holding this little red book. Um, in a way, and it reappears here in this um, prie dieu, in this sort of little prayer desk, this red book. So books in general, but all, I'm sorry, books in general, but also this little red, red book reappears throughout 
the teen mouth hours in a way that really bespeaks the significance of the book, the whole book, in this case, in the case of these um, images of the woman, um, it's a closed book, she holds it close to her. And that is as opposed to King Solomon here, who's sitting with his empty law book and um, consulting with his lawyers in his, um, in his sort of wisdom, his, his, his prophets and his lawyers, as if in his blank book, he is waiting in anticipation of the words of wisdom that will come to him. So in a, here, the blankness of this book kind of demonstrates the um, potential to be filled with his wisdom as it's acquired through his consultation with his various kinds of um, wise men. And I don't know if you can see this, but I only spotted this today when I was getting this image for the slideshow. Right down here on the right hand side to the right of this um, decorated border is a little face of somebody looking sort of in at this scene, uh, not even half drawn, a very partly drawn little face with what would have been perhaps some hands. I don't know, I'm just telling you that. I just thought it was really interesting. Um, that might appear on my Twitter in the next, my tweet stream in the next few days. Um, but so he's got a book that is blank because it's potential to be fulfilled. And then here we've got this sequence of these little red books that are closed with a strap. So codicologically, they represent real book methods, real methods of book production in, um, in this period. And you can actually sometimes see features of bindings that are contemporary with the um, time of the manuscript's production itself. So in other words, these tiny drawings give us an indication of some of the important developments in book production. And then notably here again, she has this little red book um, right in front of her, her closed strapped book of prayer that is um, waiting for her to um, begin that process of uh, engaging in um, her personal devotion um, using presumably the little red book in front of her, which represents this um, manuscript, this book of hours itself. So these, in other words, as I say, I could go on and on and on about this, but I think, and indeed the cover of my book itself, let me just, I hope maybe you can see that in miniature in the corner of your screen, is from the A. Adwin Assaulter. And of course it shows um, the A. Adwin Assaulter itself um, about to be written. So this is the, oh, okay, I could have just done that. All right, so this is this is the um, book I was just referring to, the A. Adwin Assaulter, that the scribe A. Adwin has his pen in his, left hand between his middle finger and his index finger balanced on his thumb. And he has his quill shaft because they usually didn't write with feathered quills. In his right hand balanced, um, his thumb is the anchor. It's balanced on his middle finger and it's held between the index finger and the middle finger. So again, for scribal practices, these images are incredibly valuable and have not, have been studied by Michael Gullick and I think that's probably, that's about it. He wrote an article. Oh, no, no, there was one other article. There have been about two articles on what we can tell about scribal practices um, in this period from some key illustrations. But these illustrations are actually um, very prolific in, to, in number. This is, so this is, you know, as I say, this is the, the book and, and the kind of, um, I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't call it multidisciplinary because it's book historical, but multi-pronged kind of approach that I have taken to trying to understand the medieval manuscript in its moments of production and then in its subsequent moments of reception. Um, as I said, you know, I'm working on a sort of theory that's called dynamic architecturality. And the reason for that perhaps overlong and rather silly term is simply to say that it's, it's about putting everything together. It's about the architecture of the book, architecture of the book. It's about the book as this edifice of letters. So this is the contents of the book. Um, that's derived, the contents are derived, the chapter inspirations are derived from an old English riddle um, about the making of a gospel book. So all of these quotations that open the chapter headings, a prophet to people, fingers folded knee, I'm covered with tracks, et cetera, et cetera. All of those come from a single old English riddle about the making of a gospel book. And then these are various different ways in which um, I've approached the topic of thinking through the wholeness of the medieval manuscript. 
And later this year, in autumn quarter into winter quarter, oh, so exactly a year from now, um, I've got an exhibition at the Green Library called The Handmade Book. And it will be about um, the book as archive, the book as fetish, the book as monument, the book as um, body, the book as uh, memory. So um, different areas of exploration of what the functionality, the different functionalities um, of the book. And we're using medieval manuscripts from uh, Stanford's special collections, but also pairing every medieval manuscript with a contemporary artist's book. Well, I say contemporary, there will be a William Morris and an Eric Gill, um, but modern, modern artist books are paired with individual medieval manuscripts to make this point about Booker's archive, Booker's body and so on. Um, and obviously that was kind of, that emerged from writing uh, perceptions of medieval manuscripts. So these various chapters then inspired by, um, uh, inspired by uh, this old English riddle that I'll show you in a minute. But um, in order to try and account for all of the different kinds of things that are going on in books, so the wholeness of the book, trying to take in um, annotations, as you can see, just like erased actually in the right hand margin over here, um, these kinds of interlinear additions, these kinds of um, uh, annotations or instructions, thinking about the <laughs> ruling and thinking about the whole book all at once. How do we account? for every component of the book and what difference does that make to our understanding of the whole book in the real world as it makes its way through the various stages of its life. Um, so I'm also really interested then in uh, stories about books and other, other kinds of understandings and conceptions of books and uh, obviously damage to books and, and what that tells us about cultural responses to medieval manuscripts. And this one I talk about very early on in Perceptions of Medieval Manuscripts. And this is not, um, this is a manuscript that really isn't particularly widely known. Um, and I doubt that I will have done ever, you know, anything in particular to resurrect it in terms of the um, public consciousness either, because it's a, it's, um, it, 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 it's a, a bog standard for want of a better word. It's a kind of, you know, um, dense scholastic book from the circa 1200, something like that. It's uh, Lampeter and Burgess manuscript number two. Uh, part of it actually exists in the Bodleian and then the vast majority of the codex um, exists in Lampeter. And you can see that it's a series of commentaries on um, uh, Peter Lombard and has all of these different kinds of sets of annotations and so on um, in the book. And I, I do talk about these and it's um, alphabetical. So you're looking at obviously D. What is really interesting about this, what is one of the things that is really interesting about this book is the way that it has been romanticized, I suppose, because you can see that stain on the right hand side of the image there. And then this is the last folio, you can see the stains much more clearly. And this book is said to have been used by monks in Bangor Iscoid in North Wales when they were being attacked by, um, well, there's various stories, but one of them is that they were being attacked by Vikings. And so a monk used the book as a, a mode of defense rather like um, Boniface did against the um, marauding pillagers who attacked him when he was um, a missionary on the continent because he he died um, and, it, and the story goes that these monks in Bangor Iskoid despite using this religious book as a shield from these um, invaders uh, nevertheless um, were massacred by by them and that this is the monk's blood that stains this book as a kind of um, you know a representative of the wounds of the martyr the martyred monks because the story is completely anachronistic because the book was not written till 1200 and yet the it was supposed to be they were supposed to have been attacked by the vikings in i don't know the ninth or 10th century so it's a, it's a complete falsehood but but in accounts of 19th century travelers making their way through wales george borrow in his book it's called wild wales um went specifically to lampeter in order to see this manuscript so part of thinking about manuscripts as wholes is also to take into account 
the reception of these manuscripts and responses to these manuscripts and the way that certain kinds of stories and narratives um, evolve around these manuscripts and beginning to take those into account. Um, but also remembering the text and the significance of the manuscript itself. What's quite curious about this manuscript, I've seen it a number of times over the years, um, sorry, is what you can see going on at the bottom of these folios. It's quite kind of odd, really. I'm not sure that I've seen damage as curious as this. Well, I probably have, but this is a very systematic hacking of the bottom sort of tenth of the manuscript. So there should be about another probably six centimeters of the folio beneath what you can see having been hacked. And you can see, when I say hacked, you can see that I'm really, it really is hacked. It's not cut in a sort of systematic way. Um, it's really been kind of with a sharp, it's not, it doesn't even look like a knife, does it? It looks like something more powerful than a knife, but it's been really irregularly hacked. It's a curious, curious thing. I can't um, explain, I can't explain it, but it must not have been bound when it was attacked in that way because there's no, there's even less irregularity um, than one might, than one might expect. Uh, anyway, so that, that's interesting. So it's obviously, it's a, it's a damaged book. Um, so, so the invisible, you know, so in, like when you're examining the book, you can think about the things that you can see, the text, the damage, the illustrations, the foliation, the um, uh, prick marks for the ruling, the ruling itself, all of this kind of thing. Um, but I'm also really interested in um, the, the way that people have moved through the book. And one of the ways to, to think about that is through looking at the corners of the books and how worn the corners are, um, to think about one, you know, kind of literally kind of moving through a book of this size or handling a book of this size. So to me, um, the heft of the book is, is profoundly um, significant. Um, this is the Aadwin Psalter again, and we'll see, it'll, it'll pop up um, in a while. And so the invisible traces of kind of move, people moving through these books, the um, Kate Rudy at St. Andrews has talked a lot about sort of debris and dirt left in books by people, people's fingerprints and um, by people kissing their books, uh, osculation, the osculation of books, especially um, Christ, and especially Christ in moments of um, majesty and in, in the resurrection and when he's on the cross. And um, you can, uh, you know, the, the various kinds of different imaging that she's done, you can apparently tell that people have um, touched books with their lips. And uh, that is also true in the case of uh, the St. Augustine Gospels that I talk about, which is the book upon which um, Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, it's used at Archbishop's um, ordination. Uh, installation at Christchurch, uh, Christchurch Canterbury and they are they raise this sixth century manuscript Cambridge Corpus Christi College 286 the St Augustine Gospels they raise it to their lips and they kiss it as they're as they're being ordained so the, the the traces that people leave in books is obviously very interesting and I didn't I didn't spend a lot of time on that but but uh, the invisible presence of the user of the book um, in the traces that they do leave is very very interesting so, um, you know, one can think about that in relation to something like the Exeter Book of Old English Poetry, which I'm actually teaching this week uh, with my um, third and fourth years, my seniors and juniors. And the Exeter Book of Old English Poetry is very famous, of course, circa 970, written in Exeter or possibly um, Glastonbury. And um, this book has various kinds of uh, intimations of its users in uh, dry point drawings um, and in annotations. But most significantly, and I, I, if you were there in December at the Siemens talk, I did talk quite a lot about this um, riddle here, Mech feunder sum feurna besmithida waraldstringer, binom, etc. Starts here, it's a riddle, and it finishes here. And it's the riddle of the gospel book. And it's this riddle that provides the little quotations that take me through perceptions of medieval manuscripts because this little riddle is all about the creation um, of a manuscript uh, from the first moment of its process 
An enemy robbed me of life, deprived me of worldly strength, wetted me, then dipped me in water, took me out again, set me in the sun where I was violently deprived of the hairs that I had. Um, that is obviously the animal, the cow or the sheep or the goat or the deer being slaughtered and um, its skin being removed um, after it's uh, put into water, um, taken out again, set in the sun, uh, de-haired, right, the skin de-haired, and then the hard edges of life, cutting it into it, cleaning it of the impurities, being folded uh, into openings and choirs and the bird's delight that is the quill made tracks across me using useful drops of ink over the brown margin, swallowing more wood dye that is ink, a portion of the liquid stepped on me again and travel with black tracks. So this um, riddle tells the story of the creation of the book from the death of the animal that provides the book with life to the um, using of the quill and the writing of the text to the wrapping of the book with protective boards and its gold adorned cover. So it's likely to be a gospel book um, adorned with the ornamental work of Smiths um, encased with wire. Um, and then what the book goes on to do in a much less obvious way, which is to provide for its readers, uh, the children of men, uh, salvation. So that if you use this book kind of wisely and you uh, ingest its spiritual nourishment, you'll be safer and more sure of victory uh, in heart the bolder, in mind the happier, in spirit the wiser, and so on and so on. And you will be. Uh, through the book covered with benefits and kindnesses and uh, embraces of love. So the, this little riddle, um, just this, this is the entire text that you've just seen in these two slides, tells us not just about the creation of the book, but in a sense, um, the whole of salvation history. And it's obviously very, it's a, it's a Christian text about the production of a Christian book that offers for you, not just spiritual intellectual nourishment, but the hope of um, the afterlife and salvation. And in its, uh, in its short uh, verse lines, um, it's, you know, it's, let's say it's the whole of salvation history, but also the whole of the book's potential, not just its production, but also its potential um, to improve, if you like, for want of a better word. And so it provides the structure for perceptions of medical manuscripts. Um, and there's a, the first chapter is devoted entirely to just, uh, just this riddle. And it's all about this idea of using and enjoying the book. So this word brukan, which means both to nourish, but also to enjoy. And so this is where some of the inspiration for uh, an examination, not just of the visible components of the book came to me, but also the invisible components of the book, the joy, the solace, the comfort, the um, intellectual, uh, invigoration that a book provides for us that is invisible in the book itself right people's emotional responses to books are I suppose sometimes provided by annotators who write something like rubbish in the margin um, but on the whole uh, you you don't know the responses of the majority of people who pass through the books and so you have to find this invisible component of a book's history um, in whatever spaces you can find it. And often it is, it is through space actually that you find it. So this is the A. Adrian Salter, Cambridge Trinity uh, Library, R171, circa 1155, produced in Christchurch, Canterbury. Uh, it is a book of Psalms. It's a tripartite book of Psalms. So it's the Gallican, the Romanum, and the um, uh, Hebraicum versions of the Psalms. Uh, which you can see in these separate columns here with the, um, with the Gallican version in the center. And each of the Psalms has their own sets of commentaries and the commentary for the um, Romanum is English and the commentary for the Hebraicum is Anglo-Norman. So it's multilingual, tripartite. It also has um, set the Glossa Ordinaria and various other systems of commentary, plus every folio is illustrated in the way that you can see in front of it, in front of you. And this is my own picture um, that I took some years ago now, actually. Um, you can just see the gold of the main Beatosphere be here, really kind of, you know, lifting off the page. 
Of course, this book weighs 30 pounds and is incredibly difficult to manoeuvre. And the way you have to read it is to stand, you have to stand up in front of it, even when it's on a cushion. And you can be seated, as I am here, actually, in this photo, and seated. But in order for me to really look at the book, I have to stand um, and address it standing up. So all of that is quite interesting. I talk about that in the book. Um, but the, the, um, the main thing about this Psalter and just seeing it actually really it brings me huge joy just to even see this image and be reminded of my encounter with it. But that joy is not particular to me. Um, it's been exhibited dozens of times, but we know that it brought joy and we know that it brought joy um, because of an erased, um, what's the word, uh, note, I suppose, an erased note on folio four of the manuscript. Uh, somebody's erased it because I think it gives uh, an intimation of who owns the book. But we're told that Istrid Salterium Sancti Ecclesiae Cantuariensis Traditum Est Ad Usum Domini Tome Archiepiscopi, Eustin Ecclesiae per Priorum et, cap, uh, et cap, Capitulum Eus Ad Suum Beneplacitum per Modum Mutui. So the book is loaned to him. It's a book about the um, order of the services and so on, and, you know, as it's used by the chapter at Christ Church. And it's it's given to Archbishop Thomas to use um, ad suum beneplacitum for his own joy, for his own joy. So that expectation that this emotional response uh, is, a re is a real thing is absolutely there in this note and it's likely given the probable date of this note that it's um the f i think 14th century not it's not thomas uh thomas beckett it's the later archbishop thomas um arundel i think <laughs> in the 14th century and of course you know this reminds us of the psalmic use of beneplacitum um in something like this example here the lord taking delight in his people so the idea of taking delight in the book of Psalms is kind of, you know, reflected in the Psalms themselves. So it's a really, it's a very lovely kind of um, closing of this um, circle of joy for want of a, a better kind of, better kind of phrase. But it's, you know, so the invisible components of the book's whole makeup, I think, are really as interesting, but more difficult to trace than the than the very visible signs of the production of the book and the physical um, uh, testimony to the way that people used the book. So um, one of the things that I um, that I talk about too is um, is to do is to do with memory and the transmission of memory. And this quotation from a, a pre-conquest charter reminds us why ranks of letters and the production of text is so is so important uh, in this period and in particular in this period because it's in this period that we see this uh, increasing recognition of a, of the need to move from an oral based kind of transmission of information to a written record of human experience and human endeavor um, and as this uh, as this charter reminds us, that's quia homidum fragilis memoriam oriendo, obliv, obliv, obliviscitur quod scriptura litera, literarum servando retinit. So that you, we have to do, we have to transmit through writing because the frail memory of men in dying forgets what the writing of the letters um, preserves and retains. So one of the reasons why books become so important in um, Europe, really, as the, mid as the Middle Ages progress, and particularly kind of into, the, I suppose, the 11th and 12th centuries onwards, is because of this recognition that memory is frail and, you know, life is transient, but, but where we might seek permanence is not just in the afterlife, which is a kind of given for practitioners of Christianity in this period, but um, also through the permanence that the written word uh, effects for us. So that became a, a, a kind of key, key focus for um, thinking of the book as archive and the book as repository, uh, how it becomes a space 
into which users of the book deliberately seek to engage, sometimes in ways that are very um, puzzling and difficult to understand what they're doing. And, and there I'm thinking of things like uh, sort of doodles or, 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 I don't know, leaving little, little kind of traces of one's self, little snippets of poetry and so on. But oftentimes these things that are left behind are actually names of people feel compelled to write their names. Um, like when you do a pen trial in a shop, right? The thing that you write is your name. And for many of the people in this period who do uh, manage to get hold of a book long enough to write their name in it, that is all that survives of them. And so um, I'm very interested in sort of talking about that. Um, and this is, I can't remember why I included this actually, but just the significance of writing and the um, the kind of proximity of the book to oneself and one one sense of oneself. Um, again, obviously, um, uh, book of hours. So um, also then, when I'm thinking about what's visible and invisible and users of books, is obviously what what people do to books and how they regard books. And I have just examined a student's PhD, where the student um, treats the vandalism of books like this uh, in a way that I found quite kind of curious, where she talked about, um, what did she call it? She called it something like admiring vandalism. So it's not that she necessarily admires the vandalism, but people only cut things out of books because they really want the thing <laughs> they want the initial this is the Salisbury Psalter Salisbury Cathedral Library 150 which some of you may have actually seen um, and it's been subject to um, you know this kind of quite violent um, abuse by a user probably in the 18th or 19th century who took out a very a very large number of the beautifully historiated initials or at least kind of um, inhabited initials from the manuscript um, cut them out and they've never kind of reappeared. And here it was so clumsy in the cutting out that they took out, um, as you can see, two folios in their hurry. And this might have been, you can just see the edge of the initial maybe. Actually, no, it would have been this that they wanted. This shape is a D for Domine. But in so doing, they took out the initial behind it as well. Um, so I investigate this because that part of the invisibleness of the book is <laughs> the bit that's disappeared, right? So absences in books, which are indicative of vandalistic or, or kind of greedy or um, uh, just kind of commercial enterprise. But they are also, as this student sort of did point out, they are also indicative of, of desire, right? Of, of an appreciation, ironically, and, um, and, des and a desire. So you'll have seen this, I think you might probably all have seen this before, perhaps in a very early talk that I did years ago with the Serum Seminar, um, but I talk about my own book of hours, this is my book of hours, um, and what you see is all I have. Uh, it was sold um, by Christie's in 2010 and bought by a German book dealer, book dealer, who then uh, cut it up and sold its 250 folios one by one on eBay. In fact, it's still in the process of being sold. And I bought it from a friend of mine who's a book, book, um, a book dealer in West Virginia. He wrote to me and he said, Elaine, I've got a binding. Do you want to, do you want to buy it and use it? You could use it in teaching. It's got a few scraps at the end of it. I think it's been like this for, you know, years, he said to me. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. So I bought the binding and there were these scraps at the back of it. And then um, I looked at the end leaves and I could see that it had been um, part of Edward Arnold's collection. And so I looked it up online and in 20 minutes I was I found leaves on eBay being sold by this German um, book dealer. So from the you know idea of the spiritual idea of the invisible or the idea of the user of the book, there's also this sense of the in invisible manifested in a literal sense, the parts of the book that are now absent. And so I've got a chapter on um, book breaking and fragments. And you know, this is a 19th century example. Um, this is what the book dealer 
the German book dealer said that that which is considered to be not as collectible or worthy will, under certain circumstances, he said, be taken apart, brackets, by me and sold on eBay. So this is a 19th century uh, piece of paper from a scrapbook in the British Library. Um, but these are obviously gen genuine um, initials that were cut up by the likes of Ruskin and um, other connoisseurs in the 19th century uh, pretty things, just collecting pretty things. Um, and that kind of leads me in the book to my final big chapter, which is actually on digitization and how, I don't know, it's a question more than a statement. You know, in, in the way that we receive manuscripts now through fra fragments, digital fragments online, you know, is there a danger that the excerpting of initials, the privileging of our artistic um, illustrations in books and their screenshotting and their mass proliferation on social media, Twitter, um, TikTok, Tumblr, Instagram, um, is there a danger that in receiving books in this way, the Frag the, the fragmentary status of the book, its potential to be cut up could actually lead to uh, an increase of book breaking and um, the democratization of the medieval through its um, commercial uh, selling on websites like eBay and other online auctions, but also actually through Christie's, Sotheby's, um, and uh, book dealers in the San Francisco Antiquarian Fair, etc. Anyway, I'm going to stop. That's a lot. I've I've got more slides, but you know, honestly, that's plenty. But it gives you a sense of the types of things that I cover, all, all to do with this theory of the wholeness of the book, which is not a theory that is put into practice, as you can see. And it's perhaps the not putting the theory of the whole book into practice, both in the digital realm, but also in um, you know, this, this kind of contemporary uh, sale and commodification of the book. Um, it's not understanding that the book is a singular edifice, a singular work of art that I think um, is something that we might want to address. And if nothing else, the chapter on book breaking that I've got in my volume, I think will ruffle a few feathers and I'm sort of sorry, not sorry for that. Um, and at least I think hopefully we'll, we'll um, bring it to uh, the attention of more, more readers. Okay, I'll stop. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and I'm really sorry about the technical glitches. If you um, were the recipient of those typical technical glitches, because I definitely was. There's a lot of things not going quite right at this end. So I hope it wasn't too bad from yours and that you're all still with me and not even all bailed. The end. Lovely, Lynn, thank you. Um, we are entertaining raised hands if you have questions and comments. Yes. Uh, I have my hand up. All uh, right. You can see me. Uh, uh, Elaine, um, this is an imperfectly formed question, so if it sounds um, entropic, uh, I hope you'll bear with me. But it's, it sounds to me like another way of saying, of describing what you are arguing is that books are sacred objects. And that led me to think, uh, to wonder, if there were certain kinds of subject matters that book people producing books would have regarded as inappropriate to include in a book. Am, am I making sense in what I'm trying to say here? Um, I mean, yes. would you find a, would it have been appropriate to have a book, let's say of cooking recipes or of saddle making or of, because what you're describing is, it it's all, almost feels like it's being treated like a sacred object. Yeah, 
Um, thanks, Bob. That's a that's a really good question, and um, it's actually it's 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 a, it's a really good question. It's quite difficult to answer in a in a in a hugely generalizing sense. On the other hand, um, I think it's entirely appropriate to answer it in a in a generalizing sense. Um, so most of what I'm talking about is Western European sixth to 15th century really that's mostly what I'm what I've been talking about tonight but I think a lot of what I say pertains to other um, great faith traditions too even if the book contains um, hawking h-a-w-k-i-n-g bird advice hawking advice sexual riddles information about curing warts um, you talked about cookery recipes, scientific manuals. I would probably argue that during this millennium that I'm talking about, they would still be regarded, if not as actually sacred, in a, perhaps in a sort of slightly loose sense of that word, sort of sacred, at least as so venerable, like really, like really venerable um, objects, precious, precious objects. And so I think of an example like Digby 86, which is a manuscript at Bodleian Library, Digby 86, which is a manuscript written in French, Latin and English by a family in um, Ludlow, I think it's Ludlow, Lempster, Ludlow, in that kind of Shropshire area in the second half of the 13th century. And it's a book that contains um, lives of saints, but also romances. It contains some scurrilous poetry as well as um, bits of uh, the Paternoster and so on. And there's every reason to believe, and it was produced by a, by a lay guy, um, by a, I think he was a, he was a, a lawyer. Um, there's every reason to believe that they would have regarded it with that with us with a sort of sacredness yeah um probably not to the extent that one well possibly possibly not to the extent that one would have um thought of a bible or a book of hours but you know bible the books of hours in particular were produced in the i suppose especially the late 14th into the 15th century as markers <laughs> of um social standing and as rather like you can go to, can't you go to some bookshops now and buy like 12 linear feet of a brown leather covered set of volumes to put in your shishi um, <laughs> Silicon Valley house, right? Apparently you can buy books by the linear foot that are all sort of matching. <laughs> so you're never going to read the book, but it shows what an erudite informed person you are. So there was that. There was, and I don't talk about that at all in my book, which I'm sure somebody is going to pick up on. Um, and again, I am here, sorry, this is just clinking in and out here. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do think that the majority of books would have been regarded as these really special, special things, no matter what, no matter what they included. Um, and that's definitely going to be true until, I think that's definitely going to be true until the latter part of the 13th century at the earliest, yeah. when with university students and the copying out of books that they did is a much more um, utilitarian kind of approach to literacy. But then they, te they tended to be never more than booklets, right? So these pecia, these pieces of things that they wrote. But anyway, so it's a new, that your question asks for greater nuance and, um, and it's right to ask for that. But I, you know, I, I just, I think the specialness of books in this period all the way through to the early modern period um, overrides uh, other kinds of examples that one mm -hmm. might bring to bring to bear against it. But thanks, Bob. Great question. Well, Virginia has a question. Yeah. Sorry, Virginia. Unmute yourself. There we go. Sorry. Well, um, Elaine, that was really good when you first said. Uh, you're talking about the whole book and I said uh, in my notes you know but is it whole I mean there are glosses and damages and so on but as you moved on you covered it all so I, I want to say I thought it was a really interesting and um, very good lecture I enjoyed it a lot 
As for a question, it's sort of minor, but um, you said the book is always shown as a whole and functions as a whole, and I don't really want to dispute that. But I do think of patron portraits and mm -hmm. wonder if they're more seen as a separate element. Patron portraits. Now, you know, so, uh, you know, um, thank you, Virginia, very much for, for Could your... Could you tell us what a patron portrait is, please? You want to go or you want me to go or... Virginia, you, you tell us. Okay. Um, well, many books, you, you see the uh, writer of the book handing the book over to the person who commissioned the book. Mm. Or sometimes you just see the patron in a so-called portrait. You know, it's really an image standing for a patron rather than a portrait like we might think of it. Yeah, so in that um, picture of Emma being handed the book, by the monk of Saint Bertin with the two sons kind of peeping around the curtain. That's a patron portrait. She commissioned that book. And I talk about um, the Eadwin Assaulter, which has that very famous picture of the Eadwin at the back. And he's thought to be the producer of the book rather than the patron. Um, but his role at the end of the book, that monumental kind of image of him, that role at the end of the book kind of puts him into that context of great owners or instigators of books and then I do talk about one book actually in Trinity College I think it's Trinity 0416 or something like that where there is um, a picture of the um, of a later patron of the book he's not the original patron of the book he inherits it as a second-hand object and then he has himself he has a an opening of himself with the book inserted into the book so it becomes an augmented manuscript um, and then he is shown with the book, book open on his um on his lectern and it would be interesting Virginia to look at as many of those pictures as we can find to see the way that the book itself is depicted because I think that the book is usually depicted open and usually depicted in front right in front of the patron and certainly in books of ours with a patron in a position of kind of um, holy repose or holy, holy mm. reading. And I think that probably most of the books, most of the books that I can think of in the images I've seen would be depicted whole and open. So I'll go and check, but um, that's a very interesting question. And again, very nuanced. One of the things, you know, I am actually slightly terrified about reviews because I think if you're an art historian, it's very clear from reading my work that I'm not an art historian, but I'm talking about manuscripts in, in, in illustrations. Um, you know, I, I don't specialise in later medieval stuff, but there's a lot of medieval books. And it's really interesting to see how um, people are going to respond to this because everybody is going to be able to find or know of two or three examples that could counter my general argument. So that's the kind of risk, isn't it, that you take with doing a uh, trans-chronological, multilingual, multi-type, um, multi-generic kind of study. Um, that's, a, that's a risk that you take, and then you have to hope that you have nice and sympathetic reviewers. Um, <laughs> and so everybody, fingers crossed, please. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Virginia, so much. Thank you. Quirky, you're up. Yeah, hi Elaine. Um, Hello. Question about the Bible, actually. Uh, I think they talk about the enconium of Emma being in three books, but that might just be how we talk about it now. But we talk about the Bible being New Testament, Old Testament, Gospel of John, which we refer to as the Book of John. So in the medieval period, I, I think the question is how many books was it? Or how? How, how many whole things would the Bible have been? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really great question, isn't it? Because you think about the um, uh, London British Library, what is it, additional, is it 7,000 or something like that? The Cuthbert Gospel. So some of you might have seen it in the Anglo-Saxon Kingdoms exhibition, or you may know it. It cost millions when they bought it just about a decade ago from Stonyhurst, from the Jesuit College. 
it's the Cuthbert Gospel and it's it fits into the palm of your hand. And it's got the earliest intact European binding, which is a leather bound Coptic binding with intricate kind of um, sub leather, three dimensional designs in it. It's extraordinary. And all of that, all that book is, to answer your question, all of that, that book is the um, Gospel of St. John. And it was buried with Cuthbert around 700. And then when they, um, translated his coffin in 1104 in Durham they opened the coffin and they found this book in a oh. little bag baggy right by his head it was right by his head and so on the other hand you have the Codex Amiatinus right with which the Cuthbert Gospel was juxtaposed in the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom's exhibition and the Codex Amiatinus is the only surviving Northumbrian pandect that is, every book of the Bible as they then considered it um, in the eight, from the 8th century. So these two books are roughly contemporaneous, roughly. And when it's closed, it's three foot thick. Hmm. What is that? 36 inches. 36, is it 36 inches? Three foot? No. Yeah. It's three foot thick. And it's mind-bogglingly enormous and obviously couldn't just be carried by any individual because it must weigh, you know, it's got to weigh like... 80 pounds or something like that, I don't know. Anyway, they juxtaposed these two to startling effect because your question is exactly right. What then constitutes a book? Or in the case of the Bible, you know, what was the Bible in this period? And it wasn't a fixed, it wasn't a fixed form despite Jerome's best efforts. Um, mm. Partly for practical purposes that to have a pandect, the entire Bible. We didn't get that, did we really, until the 13th century in the Parisian workshops where they produced those Bibles with a, with a blackbird feather. The writing is so minuscule in that dense kind of Gothic script, heavily abbreviated. So actually that, so that is such, I love that question. So, the, so, what, is a, so what is a book is a book is a book, right? So, that, so that this is part of the brilliance of the form of the book, the codex that the codex still exists probably as the single longest surviving, maybe the, maybe the sort of, maybe the tablet, but the single longest surviving, most successful technology of communication is still the codex because its form is, um, is kind of so malleable depending on the nature of production, the materials available, so from the very, actually from sort of the CE period, isn't it about 500 CE, from somewhere in central Italy, I think it's central Italy, there survives a codex of something like 12 leaves of hammered gold bound by a filigree binding. So it's, it's completely codex-like, but obviously um, of such a specialist nature. So... Um, there was no fixed, certainly in Europe at this time, the Bible was understood to be 72 books long. The Apocrypha was beginning to be set. The Deuterocanonical books of the Old Testament were beginning to be set, but they very rarely appeared altogether. Um, the Book of Psalms travels often on its own with the canticles. And um, other parts of the Bible were understood to be able to travel on their own. So, for example, the Pentateuch was copied as a, as a whole book, but just the Pentateuch or just the Gospels, very common, or individual Gospels, as, I, as I've already suggested. And, of course, the Apocalypse. So the Book of Revelations often is found in manuscripts on its own. So that really beautifully exemplifies the, the infinite potentiality of the book. That's a great answer, thank you. You're so welcome, it's nice to see you. So William? Would you oh, like Susan. Um, I just, I saw on one of the, the um, your slides is something about a folio, and I'm not so sure what's the difference between a book. Is this something that you can really hold on your lap and the folio is that much larger? Or are the two words interchangeable when you're talking about all these the illustrations and folios and books um and a lovely question too that could it leads to sort of tech technology allows me to bring the idea of the book kind of right down to its basic components 
when we talk in print terms of print, print um, after, you know, into the 16th, 17th and so on centuries in Europe, um, we talk about sizes of books as octavo, quarto and folio, so as, you, as you know. So the folio is the big one that sits in the wrong place in the library and you have to go rooting around for it. So the big books are the folio books, um, you know, sort of um, this size, right? Massive, yeah. massive. In manuscript uh, scholarship, the only definition of folio is as a single, hang on, a single leaf. So a single leaf is a folio. It's got a recto and a verso. Um, it's a leaf, it's a folio. It is definitely not a page, right? So this object that forms the basic unit of a book, one could argue, is uh, back and a front of a single leaf, and that is a folio. Um, and so manuscript, tech, manuscript terminology is quite different from print and causes a lot of anxiety with my students. Actually, when you think about it, the basic unit of a book is not the folio even, it's the bifolium, it's the opening, right? It's the sheet that's folded and then lots of them are nested one inside the other to form the choirs or the gathering. So the folio is half of a bifolium, it's half of an opening. Um, and is for four pages if we want to talk about in modern terms pages. So it's got nothing to do with size and everything to do with um, the unit of discussion. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. You're so welcome. <laughs> and Kathleen? On you? Muted. Not yet. There you go. Yeah. There. Okay. Fine. I really enjoyed listening to your talk about books because I love books. I I make books. I enjoy reading books, looking at books, discussing books. And I would like you to go on a little bit further about the use of the book and the value the the idea of books as objects of value in the Middle Ages that they were not later on. Because, and this goes back to, to the question about the, uh, the recipe book or something like that. You wouldn't find a recipe book. You wouldn't find uh, any secular books of that sort in the era that you've been discussing because they were too valuable. Books were too, they cost too much and there wouldn't have been anybody who wanted to spend that much money to purchase them. And of course, the other reason is that uh, the people who were making the books were the only literate people around and they were the religious uh, era, um, people, the, the monks, the, uh, and, and so, You've got a, a book that's got value because of how much it costs to produce, in addition to its value because of its uh, religious significance. And you're, you're not going to have other secular books that, have the, that combine those two things. The only possible comparable item would be a history or a, a book of um, a, a record keeping, but that's not the same thing. So thank you, Kathleen. So the first thing I want to say is you've got the best background. <laughs> well, you and Rob, you and Bob Nyden, you two have got fabulous, uh, fabulous backgrounds, but the Battle of Hastings, you know, blew to the Normans. That's what I say as a, as a pre-conquest English scholar. Um, but again, you know, it comes back down to nuance, doesn't it? Because again, you know, you can talk about this millennium. We do this all the time. And I say to my students, don't you dare do this. And this is to say medieval people all, all covered in mud, right? You know, just try. So this, I say, so what you're saying, you're introducing more nuance into the, um, into the argument. And, you know, from the 13th century, you do have, um, in fact, book production begins to move out of the monasteries in the 13th and 14th centuries and into uh, professional writing shops and especially in the in the university towns like Oxford 
um, and Cambridge and on the continent, Bologna and Paris and so on. But actually, a lot of what they are still producing is, is, is as you say, rightly, Kathleen, it's, it's religious. And even when you get people finally in the sort of 14th and most definitely in the 15th century, beginning to have their own, so wealthy professionals who were literate. And one thinks of people like Hockleave and Gower and scribes in the city of London and their families, and indeed some women like Margaret Paston, she of the Paston letters. They are able to um, either produce books themselves or to have someone produce it for them, even within the context of their own household. And they are producing, Margaret Paston produced shopping lists. <laughs> um, she, produ she produced culinary recipes. We have a number of cookbooks from the 14th and 15th centuries. We have courtesy books about how to raise your children and so on, but they are rare. You're absolutely right, Kathleen, they are rare. And books are still very expensive. And one of the things that my amazing and brilliant colleague, Orietta de Rold at the University of Cambridge, who's written a new book on medieval paper that came out in 2020, it's the book, the book on, it's such a good read. If you get a chance to read it, um, I think it's called From Pulp to Fiction, um, the History of Med Medieval Paper. She says, <laughs> one of the things that we misunderstand about the 14th and 15th centuries in Northern Europe is, we think, oh, they stopped using animal skins and they, they started writing on paper because the paper was cheap. And Kathleen, as you point out, no, no, it wasn't. It was really, really expensive. It was a luxury commodity, but it was more accessible, more easily obtainable, and perhaps a little bit more flexible in its potential uses than um, animal skin, vellum or parchment. So, so you're absolutely right, and again, you know, we can bring it down to um, individual cases. And, and this is why, um, in, indeed, all the way through perception of medieval manuscripts, even when I'm trying to build this kind of big single argument, because that's what we're supposed to do in monographs, um, I'm very conscious of the, of the counter arguments all the time and careful to always use case studies and to try and really avoid those kinds of blanket statements that I tell my students are forbidden. Um, so again, <laughs> thank you, Kathleen. <laughs> um, I appreciate the nuance that you introduced. Um, it's very valuable. Thank you. Well, thank you. But I, I know that there's not very many uh, early books. There, mm -mm. there are a few. Obviously, there are things like the Riddle books and uh, a, a few things that are secular. But there are not very many. Not very many. Until you get to about the 14th and 15th centuries. Indeed. Thank you. And Bob Nyden, what's your thought? Well, I was just going to point out a secular book that's from about 1240 that Frederick II wrote about the art of hunting with birds. Yes. Which is still uh, one of the authorities if you want to know about hawking and that sort of thing. But just, there were some, but of course he, being who he was, he could afford to publish his own books. <laughs> And he's particularly interesting in the history, long history of the transmission of paper. And actually, you know, when you're talking about hunting, a really great book that you can look up online, because of course it's digitized at the British Library. Um, and what better to do on a Saturday afternoon than just sit there going through manuscripts, because honestly, it's so entertaining. But British Library, um, Harley 978, which some of you will know, um, and Bill definitely will, because it contains the music for Summer is a Coming In. It's the only... <laughs> it's the only manuscript version of that um, bilingual uh, poem. That manuscript was owned by a guy called um, William of Winchester, I think he was. He was a monk of, I think it was Reading, or he ended up in Reading. I think he was at Worcester to begin with. And he was so badly behaved that they sent him, they, they sent him away and he ended up in mm. Reading. But it's got summers coming in. It's got... Um, all kinds of religious texts, sermons. It's got the, not the lays, what's the other one? The, not the Proverbs, what's it called? Of Marie de France. Lay. Not, no, not the lays, the other text. Aesop's fables, it's got the fables, her fables, and it's got scurrilous verse. <laughs> Plus, as you've just reminded me, Bob Nyden, yes. a hunting treatise, a treatise on hawking, and it dates to about 12... 70. So that's quite interesting. I don't know what the relationship is with the book that you mentioned, but it's one of those kind of anthologies that contains everything I need to know as a good practicing monk, but also as a bit of a 
a bit of a lad, a bit of a man about the town. <laughs> Very interesting. And you can flick through it on the um, British Library website, Harley978. Anyway, thank you. Sorry, a bit of an aside. There's also um, Matthew Paris, but in a way that has a kind of religious side because it's a chronicle of a monastery, but you know, it is a kind of secular text. But again, it's the 1240, you know, 1230, 40, 50, 50, I guess. I've forgotten exactly. Anyway. Yeah. And you can, uh, thank you, Virginia. You're absolutely right. And Matthew, Matthew Paris, of course, um, both at the Corpus, at the Parker on the Web website that we host at Stanford, um, Corpus Christi College, Cambridge 16, and Corpus Christi College 26, and then London British Library, I can't remember if it's Cotton, Claudius D, something or other. Those Matthew Parker manuscripts are all available for you to scroll through online. And yeah. Matthew Parker does seem, I don't know, I, I haven't worked with Matthew Parker, Matthew Paris. Yeah. Matthew Paris does seem to be one of those um, monastic writers who has one still, if not a foot, then three toes in the... <laughs> in the world around him, right? And uh, just the, his, own illum his own illustrations and his maps um, are just, just extraordinary, just wonderful, beautiful to look through. Thanks, Virginia. I think we have time for one more question looking at the clock. Roy, what's up? <laughs> yeah, a couple of the images you showed early on, I thought were remarkably modern for their perspective. Uh, is there a reason for that? Some of the early medieval images tend to be so stiff. But um, a couple you showed really showed a modern perspective, if you will. Is there a reason? Good artists? I don't you know. I don't know. I'm so <laughs> terrible, terrible at art myself that, um, it, you know, it makes it doubly difficult. I can talk about the illustrations in this quite sort of technical way of this is a book and this is what it's doing in the image. <laughs> but in terms of the art itself, it needs a real art historian. And um, you're right, I think particularly in that Encomium Emma portrait where the guys are peeking out behind the curtain, there is a real sense of kind of depth and perspective <laughs> and, and positionality. And what I really do love about the depictions of books in these images, no matter what they are, whether it's the Brandon plaque or something much more ornate as in the um, kind of, so a really good one to look at, and I didn't talk about any of them in this book, but I could have, is um, any apoc illustrated apocalypse from the late 12th into the 15th century. There were a whole swathe of beautifully illuminated apocalypses. And of course there are books everywhere in the images because of the book of Revelations and then John um, eat, ingesting the book and so on. So there's lots of rich, um, rich evidence for analyzing the role of the, of the book in this, uh, in this context. And they're, those, they're incredible, those illustrations. And of course, in the Eadwina portrait, the one that's on the front, on the front of the book, um, again, the perspective, it's the, the three-dimensionality of the book, um, which I just think beggars the description of Giotto being the inventor of perspective, right? It just, there are plenty of small details that, thank you, Roy, for pointing that out, that really kind of bring these pictures to life and take us away from the idea of those um, relatively sort of flat, um, flat and kind of almost kind of cartoonish, cartoonish like ways that we imagine, particularly more early medieval people um, illustrated and uh, drew and designed, because it's that again, again, it's nuance, right? That's not ubiquitously true at all. So thanks for noticing that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Evelyn, have you any closing remarks and announcements? No, just to thank Elaine for another fabulous talk. It was so good of her to do this, yep. especially at the end of a long day. Indeed, a very long day. Um, th thanks, Evelyn. And just to say um, that we are hoping, I say we, it's more like I, um, but also in consultation with some of you, are hoping to have a, um, something like a Medieval Matters lecture th towards the end of this academic year, so in spring quarter. I've got a couple of people lined up, but it's just, can we bring them here? And at the moment, right. obviously not. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah. I've not given, we've not given up on that at all. So just to um, raise that with all of you. Oh, that would and be to wonderful. say thank you. I love talking to you. You're one of the best, most um, acutely, um, but also 
friendly, critical audiences. I really, <laughs> I really love the range of expertise that you bring to um, every every one of these kinds of sessions. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. I agree. Thanks. I mean, I once gave a talk to this group, and then I gave it to the Emeriti at Santa Cruz, and you all understood it all. It was the one on the Temple <laughs> Church. And the Emeriti sort of, most of them looked at me puzzled and said it was so complicated. And then the most complicated lecture on biology was the next one. And I thought, they thought I was complicated. <laughs> you all understood it fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. I hope I see you Thank soon. You. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. See you next Bye -bye. month, folks. Bye. 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 Bye.